There's several applications of being able to work with second order differential equations, both homogeneous and non-homogeneous. A lot of them involve mechanical vibrations. Um, and we're going to talk about three different types of mechanical vibration systems, some of them easier than others. And then we're also going to take a look at an application to current and electricity as well. So let's start off with one of the first most basic representations of mechanical vibrations. And the first type of system, although it doesn't happen often, it's basically in a vacuum, it's free undamped motion or simple harmonic motion, meaning that there's nothing that's going to impede or try to restrict or expedite the motion of whatever the system is. So here's our formula. Um, mass times the second derivative of x with respect to t um, minus kx. Now k is going to be something called your spring constant, okay, or your constant of variation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then x is going to be the distance from initial displacement, okay, so x is distance from origin, basically. I'll just say distance from equilibrium. And then k is your spring constant, and then m is going to be the mass. All right, so, and how do we measure mass? Well, mass can be defined as the weight, or not necessarily the weight, but that could be um, the amount of force that's go, being enacted upon it. So a lot of times weight can be a force and can help us lead to whatever the mass of that object is. So mass times gravity, and we know that there's a lot of different ways to represent gravity due to acceleration. So 9.8 meters per second square, 32 feet per second square, etc. And we might remember this idea of Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law says that the force necessary to, spreads, to stretch a spring um, beyond its natural length is proportional. And that proportion is K, which we call the spring constant. And so let's say X is displaced um, so far from equilibrium. And we're going to call that KS plus X. Okay, so S is going to be basically like the initial position and then X is how far it is. And if we wish to derive the equation for this is actually rather easily easy because we know that mass times acceleration is going to be our force. And then we can also define F to be our force in the terms of Hooke's law. And so at some point of equilibrium, mass times gravity is going to be equal or minus KS is going to be equal to zero. So essentially the amount of mass by the gravity is going to be at some point resistant to that, um, that K times S, which is our Hooke's law. And eventually, if we throw these into the, if we throw, set them equal to one another, all right, so there's going to be some sort of force that's proportional, and then there's also mass due to gravity um, is going to be equal to our mass times acceleration or our second derivative of mass function. And we recall that at that point, mg minus ks is zero. Then eventually we wind up with this really nice equation. All right, so it's a pretty basic equation. Again, it doesn't really happen that often in real life. So we're going to take a look at an example of this as to how we're going to go through and we're just going to take a look at what um, one of these might look like. So we have a 32 pound weight, stretches a spring two feet um, from equilibrium. Um, and then the weight is released one foot above the equilibrium position and there's an initial velocity of two feet per second. We want to find the equation for free motion of the system. We want to determine what the position is after five seconds and then how long is the period of motion. So how long does it take it to basically go through an entire cycle. All right, so a couple of things we already know. We know that the weight, which is actually going to be the force, is 32. Um, we know that gravity is going to be, um, like we said, either 9.8 or uh, 32 feet per second square. Okay, since we're doing it in feet and pounds, Let's just say this mass times gravity is going to be 32 as well. Um, and we know that the distance that we're looking at is 2 feet. All right, so 
if we say x, that's the distance beyond equilibrium initially, we can say that x is equal to 2. And there's a few things that result from this. Right? So we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. We know the force is the weight, which is 32. And we know that gravity is the accelerator. So, so right away we can find that the mass is going to be equal to 1. And that's going to be measured in slugs. Not that the unit really matters that much, but we should have at least some sort of unit on there. All right, so we're going to hold on to that. Um, and then the other thing that we need to do if we look at our formula is we probably need to find this spring constant K. And the good news is, is that we have a formula. Remember, force is equal to Kx. But we know that the force is 32. And x is 2 because that's the distance that we've stretched it beyond. So this implies that our spring constant is 16. And now what we can do is we can just throw everything back into our formula. So we're going to have mass times our second derivative. Now I'm just going to call it x double prime, and we'll call it x double prime at t at some point, is going to be equal to negative kx, or 1x double prime is going to be equal to minus 16x. Um, if we wanted to turn this into a homogeneous differential, then that could be written as x double prime plus 16x is equal to 0. And we know how to solve a homogeneous differential. Um, this one's actually really easy because we can just get the characteristic equation m squared plus 16 equals 0. And I think everybody can see that m is going to be equal to plus or minus 4i. All right, so m square is equal to negative 16, so m is equal to plus or minus 4i. Right? And you might recall that this is a case 3 type. I know it's been a little while since maybe we worked on some of these case 3s, right? but m is going to be plus or minus 4i. And remember with case 3, so this means that a is going to be 0 and b is going to be equal to 4 in our case 3. And so what we can do is we can derive an equation that x at t is going to be equal to e to the 0t times c sub 1 cos of 4t plus c sub 2 sine of 4t. Or another way to write this really nicely is that x at t is going to be equal to c1 cos 4t plus c2 sine 4t. All right, so let's hold on to that for right now. The other pieces of information that we have is we have that this initial condition, one foot above equilibrium, and an initial upward velocity of two feet per second. So that's going to be our initial conditions. All right, now we have to be careful with this because remember, gravity naturally pulls things in a downward position. So in other words, well, the natural position is actually below equilibrium. So the signs are going to be flipped. So since the weight is released one foot above equilibrium, we're going to say initially that x at zero is going to be equal to negative one. And since the motion of the upward velocity is, is indeed upward, then we can say x prime at zero, which is velocity, is going to be equal to negative two. All right. To finish solving our system, we need the second derivative, or I'm sorry, the first derivative. So x prime at t, we just need a chain rule going on here, so it's minus four c1 sine 4t plus 4c2 cos 4t. And now we can just get our system by substituting back into the original um, system. And hopefully we can solve for c1 and c2 very nicely. So now the system becomes uh, negative 1 is going to be equal to c1 cos 
of 4 times 0 plus C2 sine of 4 times 0. And then negative 2 is going to be equal to negative 4 C1 cos 4 times 0 plus 4 C2 sine 4 times 0. Or 4 times cos, excuse me. Um, I copied that down incorrectly. So this is a sine and this is a cosine. I was looking at the initial of uh, the, the original function. So this is going to be our sine function and this is going to be our cos function. And there is a lot of good news about this because we know that the sine of 0 is 0. So that's going to cancel this. It's also going to cancel this. Um, we know that the cosine of 0 is 1. So even nicer, this is going to yield two very easy solutions. We're going to say negative 1 is equal to c sub 1 because that's just going to go to 1. And then negative 2 is going to be equal to 4 c sub 2. All right? Or, in other words, negative 1 half is going to be equal to c2. And so the equation of motion that we get, I'm going to call that x of t, is going to be equal to um, negative cos of 4t minus one-half sine of 4t. So that's our equation of motion, not too difficult. Okay, so that's our answer to part A. Part B is going to ask us to be able to find the position after five seconds. That's probably the easiest part of the problem. So we would just find x at five. And x at 5 is really easy. It's just going to be a computation. So x at 5 is going to be equal to minus cos 4 times 5 minus 1 half sine 4 times 5. Um, and in exact terms, that's negative cos 20 minus half sine 20. Um, and then, of course, we want to approximate that, making sure that we're in radian mode. All right, so if I was to approximate that, opposite cos 20 uh, minus 1 half sine 20. And making sure, again, I'm in the right mood. And I get negative 0.8646. And so what does that mean? Well, remember that x is the number of feet that were displaced, okay? So we go all the way back up to the beginning, all right? Remember what x represents. That says how many feet were displaced, okay? And so that means that we are going to be 0.8646 feet and remember, negative actually means above equilibrium, all right, because we're going in the opposite direction of gravity. So what does this mean? After five seconds, um, this means that the weight or the object or whatever it is, I, I can't remember what it was, um, it was a pound, it was a weight. So the weight is... 0.8646 feet above equilibrium. All right, so not only is the distance of the um, important, but whether it's above or below equilibrium is also important. And then the last part of the problem, which is going to be fairly easy as well, um, how long is the period of motion? All right, well, remember to find period. Um, we can literally just find the period of the cosine or the sine function. Right. And remember, there's this formula that the period, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be equal to 2 pi over b. And b is going to be the coefficient of whatever's in front of the t variable. So in this case, 2 pi over 4. All right, and again, that's just the coefficient. Remember, they're always going to be the same. <clears throat> or in this case, pi halves. And pi halves is going to be approximately 1.57. <clears throat> and 
And what does that mean, 1.57? Well, 1.57 seconds, right? Since it takes 2 pi to go through 1, we're essentially saying, okay, well, if I throw pi halves in here, well, 4 times pi halves would give you 2 pi, right? So, so basically it takes 1.57 seconds to be able to go through one of the periods of motion. All right, so a very basic overview of this type of example uh, of, um, of non-resistance. So we'll take a look at one more of these and then we'll start taking a look at what happens when we start throwing in some other factors.